Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you are watching Israeli News Live. Thank you for those of you that are joining us tonight on live stream. Uh, we are live streaming this broadcast because I feel like that this is uh, an important broadcast indeed. Uh, the titles are different on live stream. You are seeing how that Israel will join with Rome. And of course, those of you here on YouTube are seeing prophecy stays in the headlines. Now we're going to be looking at not only how that Israel is going to join in with the Vatican as well, but we're also going to be looking at current events, what's going on uh, in the Middle East as well with Russia, things that are happening uh, all in that area there and how we are on the brink of some very serious things. Uh, we've done some very deep look into Russian news as well as uh, different other different English speaking news uh, sources there to be able to bring you up to date things that are happening. But I want to get right into one of the most concerning issues for me here lately. And that's something that happened uh, just a few days ago where uh, the article here that we have here, Christian Post News, June 15th of 2016, Pope Francis meets with evangelical Pentecostal leaders in John 17 spirit. Uh, says here, the article, a little bit of a background, this Pope Francis and several prominent evangelical and Pentecostal leaders met in Rome last Friday to discuss areas of mutual agreement and where they respectfully disagreed. The aim of the gathering, which had no official agenda, was to build unity between Christian traditions that have historical enmity. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Especially in light of the fact where God says in Genesis, I'll put enmity between thee, between the woman, and between thy seed, speaking of the serpent, uh, talking about that devil himself. So if there's enmity between the two, then one of them must be on the opposite side of the coin altogether. Um, anyway, in, 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 enmity, by the way, for those that may not know, is hatred. Uh, and there has been a lot of hatred over the years. Anyway, it goes on to say the Reverend Dr. Geoff uh, uh, Tunicliffe former Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance and Chairman of the Advisory Board of Christian Media's Corp uh, Corporation said in an interview with the Christian Post Tuesday that there was a John 17 spirit during the two meetings he had with Pope Francis. Uh, Tuna Clef noted that formal meetings with the Pope are often said to last only 30 minutes, but one informal meeting with Francis and evangelical and charismatic leaders lasted over two hours. Those at the gathering sensed the presence of God, according to, to Tuna Clef, and a unity of the Spirit as their discussions focused on Jesus Christ, even as they talked about theological differences. By the way, Christian Post News, June 15, 2016. Uh, I don't know if you can see it as well on your screen there. I do have the actual link here in the description here on our, on our screen there if you wanted to go ahead and pause it when it loads on YouTube a little bit later. Now, let me just back up on something here because as I stated on Israeli News Live, I make the comment that Israel will have to join in with Rome. Now, there's a major ecumenical move going on right now, friends. Major. It's a major move that's happening. And we have seen not only uh, the, the Pentecostals, Evangelicals, uh, Charismatic, uh, Lutherans, uh, Episcopalians, every Christian denomination pr practically has joined back up with the Mother Church. Uh, and we think often of Revelation uh, where it says, uh, you know, that, that she is the mother of harlots. And of course, the daughters are flooding back home like never before. But that's not just the Christian denominations. That's also the Islamic belief as well because the Catholic Church created the Islamic uh, faith. Un unfortunately, many Arabs of the world have no idea that it was created by the Catholic Church, but it was. That's why you see the Islamic women dressed like nuns. It's why you see them walk down the streets with rosary beads in their hands as well. No wonder why they believe that Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, to be the prophet of God as well. They believe him, that he is returning back, with, according to their, to the Quran, with the Mahdi. Now, this is what's kind of odd and peculiar, but the Catholic Church wanted to make sure they still maintain some of the same types of belief. Alberto Rivera, 
is an excellent source on that, showing you the inside beliefs. A former Jesuit, I believe like 25 years he was a Jesuit in the Catholic Church, exposing these things about the Catholic faith and what they actually really do believe. Now, we also saw not long ago that the Catholic Church also signed uh, on the Nostra Aetate the 50-year, uh, this was on the 50-year anniversary with the Jewish Congress. Now, that's not the Knesset. The Jewish Congress are rabbis, Orthodox rabbis from around the world that have what they call the Jewish Congress, but they signed an agreement with the Catholic Church to establish a tithe or a ties together or a covenant with the Catholic Church. Uh, and as I was stating in the title on Israeli News Live on live stream there, the, 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 the Jewish people, they will, they will come in to the Catholic Church. They're going to come in and become part of the... Uh, gosh, how do I put this, friends? The Israeli government, somewhere along the way, is going to have a direct tie with the Catholic Church. The reason why I say this, you remember the scripture in Revelations, uh, Revelation 18.4, and yes, I do have the Bible close enough I could grab it. I know it by heart. He says in there, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins or receive of her plagues. Let me just, I'm going to pull it up exactly for you because it's something I think a lot of people overlook. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, okay, that you be not partakers of her sins and you receive not of her plagues. Now, I know that we could, we could say my people also is the Christian church as well, the true believers of Yeshua, but I really think in this case here, much as it was uh, in the case of Daniel the prophet, when the angel said to Daniel, uh, the, violent, uh, excuse me, the lawless of your people will try to marry the vision. We find that in Daniel chapter 11, verse, I believe that's verse 14. Now you don't have that, it's not written that way in the uh, KGV, but that's how it's written in the Hebrew. That the lawless, the sons of the lawless, will try to marry the vision, but they shall stumble. And we just discovered in recent broadcasts, if you haven't seen them, go to YouTube, Israeli News Live on YouTube, backtrack, look at some of these broadcasts we brought out, those sons, plural, of the lawless of Daniel's people, the Jewish people, happened to have been Shimon Perez and Ariel Sharon, who actually signed a, a covenant. Ariel Sharon, excuse me, Shimon Perez is the first one starting this back in 1993, but later Ariel Sharon, before going into the coma, ended up signing a two-state agreement for, what, for, the, for the Catholic Church to, to fulfill the prophecy that they would divide the land. Now the thing is, it's never gone public. Why? Because uh, Yasser Arafat, when he found out, or when it, when it was put to him that there was going to be a third temple on the Temple Mount, he refused emphatically and says, no, I'm not going to do that. And so then he mysteriously dies. Now, of course, the Arab people, the Palestinians, want to blame it on the Jews that they were the ones that killed him. I disagree with that. I believe it was a Jesuit on the inside, someone that was close to him there that he trusted that actually took his life, maybe by poisoning or something of that sort there. I don't think the Israelis had anything to do with it because you have to understand the Vatican, see, they are the ones with the prince that shall come. Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9. See, they would be of the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. See, destroy the temple and the sanctuary. According to Daniel 9, I think it's verse 24, 25, and 26, right in that area there. Now, the prince that shall come is not the Mashiach. He's not an anointed prince. He's just a prince that comes. He's of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Well, that happens to be Titus, the Roman general. Obadiah indicts the Romans for this job and calls him Esau, in fact. Keep that in mind. We're going to be going back into that in just a little bit here. Then we're going to get deeper into the news. I know it's more of a prophetic type of news broadcast tonight, but I need you to really hold on to these things and understand. All right, so... Let's get back into this here. So what do we have? We have God wants His people to come out of her lest they be partakers of her sins and also receive of her plagues. The plagues are going to be brought upon the world 
as uh, by your two witnesses of Revelation 11. And by the way, another incredible revelation that God just gave me the other day. If those of you that, that joined us uh, there in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives when, I, when God had given me the beautiful revelation of Pentecost, Shavuot literally means weeks, and how I said that when the fire came down, the fire came down during the time when God was delivering the, his, his law from Mount Horeb. He delivered the law to the children of Israel, and they all saw, the whole congregation saw the pillar of fire come down, but there was no similitude of God, nothing like that. And, then, and that was 50 days after, see, 50 days later, that's when it happened. And then what happened? We also find this, the same thing happens on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after. Later, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right, now, here's another interesting thing about Shavuot or Pentecost. There's always to be two barley loaves of bread to be made as an offering unto the Lord. There's your two witnesses right there in Shavuot. Oh my gosh, I'm getting excited, guys. All right, now, I, I don't want to get too far off track. It's a long broadcast, so I keep going this way here. Anyway, there was this interesting meeting that the Pope did that he met with these evangelicals, etc., that were there. Um, and uh, let me just back up to that real quick there to see, see different ones that were involved in that. Because uh, I know it, it mentions them. In, okay, Pentecostal leaders as well. Prince Pentecostals. I, I, I was blown away by seeing that. All right. Now they say that John 17. All right. I want you to see what John 17 really is about. Remember this guy here, Tony Palmer? Yeah, Tony Palmer was the one that came and said he came in the spirit of Elijah at Kenneth Copeland's big meeting there. Well, guess what? He's the one that actually started the John 17 ideology for the Catholic Church. But by the way, there is a Catholic website that claims that Pope Francis is one of those two witnesses. And yet, Tony Palmer claimed to be the Elijah. Which one is the Pope then? Or is the Pope one and somebody else is the other? I don't know. Anyway, let me play this for you here. He's going to quote that scripture for you. He said, I do not pray for these alone. He's quoting John 17, the verses that they're applying to this, okay? That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they may also be one in us. So that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them. Alright, that's just to kind of give you a little flavor there. He's quoting the last part of John chapter 17 from about verse uh, 24 down to verse 26. Okay, now that's exactly what this guy here, Mr. Geoff, Tony Cliff is stating as well that they're come together in the spirit of John chapter 17. All right, now what does that tell you though? All right, let's look at the scripture itself. We'll just take from where he picks up there 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. They, I'm sorry, didn't, I don't even think he quotes there, but anyway, they, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Guys, do you not realize that in the Antichrist spirit, Antichristo, literally, this Greek word right here, means a pseudo-Christ, a one that takes the place. Remember, what does it say in Daniel? Daniel 9, after we see the Mashiach that comes, the anointed prince, then it speaks of just a prince coming. A prince is what? This is the Antichristo. This is the one that is like Christ that is coming, but he's not the real guy. He's not the one that is Mashiach. He's not the anointed prince. Okay? And they're quoting John 17. Okay? As if they say, but, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. They said they're coming to that spirit, and I have declared unto them that thy name, and I will declare it, that they love wherewith thou hast loved me, may be in them, and I in them. Now he's claiming to be Christ, and he's saying to the outsider, the churches and stuff, you need to come in and become one with us. This is what God's intention is all along. 
Oh, gosh, guys. Now, we're going to get deeper into the news here in a minute. I'm going to hit the part about Russia very soon, okay? So just bear with me, but this stuff was very important to me, all right? There was something else I wanted you to be able to see right here. Tony Palmer, he delivers Pope Francis' message to Kenneth Copeland at his pastor's conference on January 21st, 2014, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. All right, now, Pope Francis makes a very interesting statement in here. He says, I am yearning. He says, actually, he uses the word nostalgia, which they translate as yearning of that embrace. All right, now, I just want you to hear this just for a moment. Uh, it's not going to be loud enough for you. He says, I, I am nostalgic or yearning that this separation comes to an end and gives us communion. All right? I am yearning of that em embrace. As I was listening to these words again, this was the video recorded statement that Tony Palmer took to the Kenneth Copeland conference there. And by the way, this is where Tony Palmer tells the Pope that he's going there. These were the big fish. These were the ones that had the mega churches of 10,000, 2,000, and they drive all day. They fly their all private jets and things like that, right? But then I begin to go back and listen to this. And when I saw this part here, I am yearning of that embrace. The Lord revealed to me something that was just astounding. Why does he say, I am yearning? of that embrace. You have to remember, Obadiah clearly identifies Esau as the modern day Romans because he indicts Esau for the destruction of the temple and the taking away of the treasures from the temple 2,000 years ago. Now Esau, excuse me, Obadiah prophesies this long before it happens. And even scholars today say, I've said it many, many times, I'm repeating myself for those that listen all the time, scholars say today that Titus was not alone. He used the Syrian forces to help do this battle, and it was really the Syrians that did all the dirty work. Well, Obadiah knows that. He says, you stood aloof while your brother, see, while your brother was taken away, but he also speaks about how that they took his substance and you rejoiced at his calamity. And God said you shouldn't have done that. Alright? Well, that was Titus the Roman general. And they made the Ark of Titus in rejoicement and celebration for the destruction of the second temple and for taking the temple treasures. Alright, so it clearly identifies Rome. Now, if God identifies the Romans there through Obadiah the prophet as Esau, follow me carefully, especially those of you listening on live stream. I know you can go back and play this on YouTube later tonight when it loads up there. Follow me carefully on this. God identified Titus the Roman general in a prophecy in the future that he indeed was Esau, all right? Now, I'll just, I'll share this with you because I want to make sure you guys really get this, okay? I'm going to take you back to it. Obadiah, verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Therefore, you know it's all about Esau, okay? If you drop down now, verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother Jacob, Shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now Esau and Jacob actually reconciled their differences. And friends, that's what's going to happen today. It's going to look like the Catholic Church reconciles the differences with the Jews that are in the land today. But it's only a front. It's only a fraudulent reconciliation. Because Esau's got to fulfill the prophecy. Esau, back during the times of Jacob, when he was actually alive, they, they, they departed one another. Jacob thought he was going to die by the hand of his own brother that day, but he didn't. Now, keep in mind, I want to get to a point here in just a second. First, I want to establish that wrong is indeed Esau, so you don't mess this up. All right. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, that's the Syrian army, and foreigners entered into his gates, again the Syrians, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. So, see, 
Obadiah, by the Spirit of Almighty God, indicts Esau as just as guilty as the ones that did their dirty work. All right? But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother and the day he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah. See, it's the house of Judah, so it identifies also the time period. It, again, it's a prophecy, prophesied before it ever happens. That's 70 AD. Okay? You should have not their destruction, neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldst not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. And what did they do? They took the temple treasures. It's on Titus's ark right there. All right? Now, this is your mystery Babylon. That's why Revelation calls it mystery Babylon. Because that's the prophecy. Now, if you drop down to verse 16, and as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. In the Hebrew language, that's clearly in the masculine plural. And Pope Francis fulfilled that in Passover 2014. When he and a male-only delegation drank upon God's holy mountain, Mount Zion, which by the way, verse 17 clearly identifies, Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. So it is Mount Zion which is the mountain. And that's where he went to the upper room. He drank there. I had no problem with him being in the upper room. But the fact is, is he didn't just do it in the upper room. They also threw the Jews out of King David's tomb and they did it there. And the Pope of Rome was given an official seat back in 2013. And David's throne there. So therefore, they were, he was showing when he wore his triple crown that he was indeed the very king of Israel. He sat there with men only showing that he was also the type of Christ and that this was his disciples having their communion in the upper room. And he's wanting you to come together and have the communion with him as well. Right? <clears throat> then it says, and the nations will continue to drink and to, and to be forced to swallow down. Because then it was gender inclusive and from that day forward they begin to do communions again. Now, I brought out on Israeli news recently, I think it was on live stream as well here, that what is happening in Israel today, they removed all the placards in there, now they even call the rabbi's office the World Peace Center. you got to be kidding me. And a man standing there tells me that they now have full peace with Rome. All right, so Rome, the Israel has got to make a covenant. They've got to come in unity with Rome. <clears throat> Why? Because God says, come out of her, my people. The only way God can get Israel to come out of this covenant with Rome is for Israel to make the mistake to make the, the covenant. All right? But he says he'll bring out the plagues. Why? Because the two witnesses will come, bring judgment, and he wants his people out. All right? So that's what's going to happen there. But let's back up, though. Uh, we've identified now, Obadiah clearly identifies Esau as the Romans, right? Do you remember? And I have the scripture on the screen. Oh, now, well, you guys can see it. Genesis 27, 38. You remember when Jacob, he did deceive his brother. He did get his birthright. Not only did he get his birthright, but he also got the blessing of his father. And what happened? When Esau come in, to give his father the food that he so loved and how he loved Esau. See, Rachel loved Jacob. But Esau's father, Isaac, loved Esau. And what happens here? He comes in there, Genesis 27, 38, and Esau said unto his father, when he finds out his brother's already deceived him, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Now, that may not seem like a lot to you, friends, but look at what the Pope is saying. I am yearning of that embrace. He is a descendant of Esau. He literally, his own parents are Romans as well. This man in his own veins, he may mean well. I'm not, I don't say that everything that Pope Francis does is a bad thing. Technically speaking, from a natural eye, it doesn't look that bad. But it is a spiritual significance is happening right here friends and when this man says I am yearning of that embrace that is the spirit of Esau in Pope Francis crying out for the embrace of his father Isaac whom has given the blessing over to Jacob his brother Israel 
and he wants that blessing. And what's going to happen? Israel today, they're going to come out of there. They're going to come out of her, my people. And they're going to separate from this Catholic Church, this unity that's being built right now. Why do you think the Pope is doing all this? Why do you think he's bringing in all the churches? All their daughters have got to come back. He's also wanting to trap Israel right in there. And they'll go along with it. Many Christians will go along with it. But I think even in that case there, the Christians will have to come out of her, my people. Just like the Jews have got to come out of her. Gosh, friends. I know that on this Shabbat message I'm giving you today, I, I've got, I want to bring out some important news along with it, but I hope you're seeing that, that His words are the words of the Spirit of Esau. I am yearning of that embrace. He wanted his father. Esau wanted his father's blessing, but he couldn't get it because Israel had it. And it's the same today. The Catholic Church, the Pope of Rome, is yearning for the embrace of Almighty God, but he can't get it because it belongs to Israel. And Israel is going to be the one that has that embrace. And you're going to see it manifest in the very near future. Oh my gosh, friends. Anyway, I, I'm so excited about this. and uh, We'll move forward, though. Let's, let's get into the news that's going on now. House approves defense aid to Israel despite a veto threat. So thank God for the Congress of the United States is standing against the Obama administration. They approved a bill for $576 billion defense spending bill, which includes $635.7 million for U.S.-Israel missile defense programs, despite the threat that Obama is going to veto it. Of course, Obama has excuses of why he'll veto it. But nonetheless, Israel keeps trying to play two sides. They, they want to play with the American side. They want to play the Russian side. And eventually... It's probably going to turn against them, especially in light of the possibility that they may just double back on Trump there and make sure he doesn't get the White House. Who's going to get it then? Is it going to be Hillary Clinton? Who knows? Anyway, let's go into some more news here. This is getting into the Russian side. Now, I tried to put some links up on some of these things here for you guys. Uh, I don't know how well it's going to be for you. These are Russian uh, websites here. Uh, or Russian language websites. I've been working on a lot of work in the background because of all the tensions between the United States and Russia and what's going on to let you see what's happening. Anyway, Putin, a U.S., a great power, superpower. He said this today. Uh, it's been reported on many different websites already. Uh, anyway, Russian President Vladimir Putin, during his speech at the St. Peter's International Economic Forum, expressed doubts about the democratic elections in the United States. He doesn't think Donald Trump is going to get the presidential seat. He believes he's going to be thrown under the bus. Okay? Prosecutors are distilled off voters from sites afraid that will be put in jail, but that's their problem. They like America, a great power, a superpower. We accept it. We want to work with the U.S., said Vladimir Putin. He also noted that Russia and the world need a country like the U.S., but nobody wants uh, so, so, so that they interfere. Now, notice this here. I didn't translate this very well. He also noted that Russia and the world need a country like the U.S., but nobody wants. In other words, nobody wants it. Nobody wants the U.S. because of the way the U.S. is doing it. And this is why he says this. So that they interfere in our affairs, they explain to us how to live, prevented Europe to build relations with us. All right, so there's two things in this, in this article when you read it there. You find out, one, Putin realized, first, the, the reason I give the name like this, a great power, a superpower, is the fact that he acknowledges the United States as a superpower. That's no big deal. Everybody knows it. All right? But the key thing in here, though, is, and I, and I read the whole article there, it doesn't, it goes deeper into the article there. He believes that Trump is going to get the popular vote, but he believes that they're still going to throw everything over to Hillary. That's what his uh, opinion is on this. And then he mentions at this meeting here today, he says that, uh, that the U.S. is interfering in their affairs and they're trying to prevent Europe to enter in relations. He's talking about the sanctions there. He knows that the EU is planning on doing sanctions continuing through 2017. But Putin is also saying out to the EU, look, let's, let's work this out together. All right. Anyway, this is the next article here. Putin urges the EU to restore cooperation with Russia. Says Moscow is ready to meet halfway. 
He's willing, to, he's willing to lift his sanctions if they're willing to lift theirs. Now, Vladimir Putin has called on the EU to restore cooperation with Russia. Speaking at St. Petersburg International Economic Forum on Friday, Putin said Russia was ready to meet halfway, but stressed that the EU should also be willing to compromise. We do not hold a grudge and are ready to meet our European, European partners halfway, the Russian president told the forum. All right. Now, our recent meetings with representatives of the German and French business circles have uh, proved that European businesses is willing and ready to cooperate with our country. But he goes on to say, but it's going to take the politicians to step in and do something about it. Now, I personally think that the U.S. is going to read his statement of our sanctions are working, Russia is crippling under the econ economic pressure, and that they should keep the sanctions on because they're wanting to collapse the, the economy of Russia to a point to where Russia would totally crumble and they could easily just walk in and take over Russia without even firing a shot. I think that's the way the U.S. Uh, Obama administration is going to perceive this particular, uh, these words that he has said here now. But, now, things will get a little bit more tricky here. RT, RT News is reporting here, hawks rising, dozens of State Department officials call for U.S. strikes against Assad in Syria. Now, this is the State Department employees. It was a, uh, a, a thing where the, the employees there, the high-ranking officials as well as moderate officials, can express their desire of what they would want to do with Russia under the, the current situation. I think it's a big smokescreen myself. John Kerry also seems to side with them. B uh, bucking current U.S. policy, dozen of State Department officials have reportedly signed an internal document calling for military action and regime change in Syria, claiming that it is the only way to defeat Islamic State and end the war. That doesn't make any sense at all. The whole thing that the Obama administration has been trying to do is to overthrow Assad in the first place. Now this is what the State Department is doing and they're trying to say this is a change. It's not a change. It's what they've been wanting to do the entire time. All right. The moral rational for taking steps to end the, de the deaths of suffering in Syria offer five years of brutal war is evident and unquestionable. The New York Times quoted the document as saying, the status quo in Syria will continue to present increasingly dire, if not disastrous, humanitarian diplomatic ter uh, terrorism uh, related challenges. So they're blaming Bashar al-Assad for everything. And by the way, Bashar al-Assad is the only one that's even trying to take up for the Christian community that is in the Middle East there, for those of you that do not know that. Uh, when it comes to the United States or the Catholic Church, even for that matter, they always leave the so-called Christian churches that are there in the middle. I don't even want to call them so-called. If they're dying for the, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, I have to stand with people like that. I don't care what their denominational background is. These people are having their heads taken off for their beliefs and their stand for Jesus Christ as the Messiah. All right. And the only one in the Middle East besides Vladimir Putin that's standing up for these people here is Bashar al-Assad. He's actually trying to protect the Christian communities there. Maybe this is why they hate him so bad. In the Catholic Church, the Pope of Rome, when he goes down to Greece not too long ago, he doesn't bring any of the Christians back. He only brings the Arabs back. Same thing with Barack Obama. He had the opportunity to rescue thousands of Christian refugees from these war-torn countries that even as refugees, they suffer and die at the hands of their own people because of their beliefs in Yeshua as the Messiah. They won't rescue them. What was it? Eight families? But the Obama administration rescued tens of thousands of the Arabic families. Now, I'm not saying Arabic or not, Life is life, and I know that matters. So I'm not throwing the Arabic people, the refugees that are dispersed because of these wars over there under the bus, but there again, the Obama administration is the one that armed ISIS in the first place. And they work with Turkey, who is backing ISIS as well, and say nothing about it. And the only ones that are truly there trying to fight to liberate from ISIS is the Kurds. And by the way, it is said that 60%, now I got this, this is from, uh, from what I understand with uh, Pastor Bagley, he said that 60% of the Kurds are considered to be Christians. Now, Avi Lipkin stated, and we've got an interview with Avi Lipkin, we'll be loading uh, later this week here for you guys. Avi said it's only 20% of the Kurds are Christians, but 20% is a huge number amongst the Kurds. And these people are the ones that are fighting and trying to stop ISIS. Women out there even fighting 
to liberate from ISIS. And yet the whole world turns against them, including the Saudis. And that's concerned because I see Israel trying to side with the Saudis as well. And the Saudis, that's only going to put them on the opposite end of the gun barrel with Russia. All right, now, let's look at some more interesting things going on. Barack Obama and Deputy Prince of Saudi Arabia discussed the transition of power in Syria. You know, I couldn't find this in any American news whatsoever. This here was on uh, Rus, rusdialogue.ru news, okay? June 17, 2016. This just came out today. In fact, it was only a couple of hours old when I got this news here. With regard to Syria, the parties reaffirmed the importance given support uh, to the ceasefire and political transition of power from Assad and head Zamas Lednago Prince. Now, that is... Uh, Solomon's son. He is, the, uh, he is the defense minister of Saudi Arabia. They agreed on the importance of government support for national reconciliation in Libya. The report says, uh, uh, the, report says the White House. Uh, previously, Russia, Russian conversation wrote that uh, Kerry commented on the call of the State Department to bomb Syria as well. Now, it looks like John Kerry, is, again, is backing the State Department's call for stepping up a bombing campaign specifically targeted against the Syrian military, Bashar al-Assad's forces directly. All right? They brought in the defense minister for Assad. This was their discussion, and they're literally taking the steps now to say, we're going to overthrow Assad. And yet... Russia sitting there, and Assad just said the other day, they're going to fight to take back every inch of their land. Friends, that includes the Golan. All right? Russia's not saying anything about it. Now, things are going to get a little bit more complicated here. I want you to see what else is going on. All right? Another one. This, will, of course, is on RT News. I don't need war. Bulgarian Prime Minister rules out uh, going NATO flotilla in the Black Sea. This is a big issue going on right now. It's been going on a little while now. NATO is talking about, talking about building up a big naval, NATO naval presence in the Black Sea. The Bulgarian president obviously realizes this will bring about a World War III. Prime Minister ruled out participation in plans to form a united NATO Black Sea Naval Task Force to counter the Russian Navy in the region. The president of Romania said the initiative is about joint drills, not maintaining a separate fleet. I always say that I want the Black Sea to see sailboats, yachts, large boats with tourists, and not become an arena of military action. I do not need a war in the Black Sea. Reuters cited Bulgarian's Prime Minister uh, Boyko uh, Borisov as saying at a media briefing. To send warships as a fleet against Russian ship exceeds the limits of what I can allow. Borisov told reporters in Sofia on Thursday, as cited by Bloomberg to deploy destroyers aircraft carriers near the resort cities of Borgas or Varana during the tourist season is unacceptable. All right. Article goes on to say, after the USS Porter armed with a Salt cruise missiles in Aegis ballistic missiles defense system entered the Black Sea last week. Moscow promised response measures to Washington. If a decision is made to create a permanent force, of course, it would be destabilizing because this is not a NATO sea. Russian news agencies quoted senior foreign ministry official Andrei Kielin as saying. Now, did Russia retaliate? Yes, they did. And this was reported by Ukrainian news. And the Ukrainian uh, is actually in the Russian language, but it's in Ukrainian news uh, on uh, Sogo, uh, S E G O D N Y A dot U A. That's Ukrainian news. June 17th came out today. Russia has again started to bomb the opposition in Syria. In other words, Russia is now bombing U.S. backed rebels trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. So did they respond to what they're doing in the Black Sea? Absolutely they did. It says Russian aviation bombed the positions of the Syrian opposition fighting against the terrorist group Islamic State. They're not fighting against Islamic State. They're fighting against Bashar al-Assad's forces. All right. The official said, the United States Department of Defense reporters, Reuters, the official said that the airstrikes was applied according to the opposition. 
which supports the United States. U.S. Department of Defense employees criticized Russia's actions, noting that the firing area was not Russian or Syrian army, so the version of self-defense is excluded. We will seek an explanation from Russians why it happened and assurances that it will not happen again, the U.S. official added. In other words, the U.S. realizes this is Russia's response in retaliation. It is a proxy war. The wars in Ukraine, as well as in Syria, is a proxy war between the United States and Russia already. We're already at war, friends. We're already at war. They're just using two different militaries to do the battling. It's getting serious. We also see the Pope of Rome trying to weigh in and bring about world peace. It's later than you think. If you've never given your own life to Yeshua, to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, I encourage you to do that today, friends. I really do. I'm not saying that to be just to say it. I, you know, I don't say it that, that very often, but I'm telling you, it's a late hour. It's a time, as the old saying goes, it's a time to get to Goshen. It's a time to know who your Savior really is. It's important. Friends, one last thing in closing here. We cannot do this type of broadcast without your help, and we thank you. We want to thank you for those of you that have helped us to uh, bring together the trip in Israel, and we're fixing to go right back to Israel. It looks like, uh, I can't say for sure, but it looks like we're going to be going back to Israel within the next week or so. Very important things that are happening. We need to get back over there. We need your support, and we thank you. I don't want to say any more about it. Thank you for supporting this work, and thank you for your continued support. God bless you. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.